<laughs> Chapter 13 I move in a few weeks later. It only takes one trip to get all my stuff from Dad's to Izzy's, though he certainly tries to store me while I'm packing. It's the end of an era, he writes in an email to which he has attached a baby picture of me and a screenshot of a frowny face emoji. If by error you mean 8 months, then sure, I respond, and tack on the clown emoji for good measure. The response comes immediately, a photo of a stack of DVDs, Jurassic Park, National Treasure, and of course, Blade Runner, all good movies, you should check them out. I groan, but I can't help the smile spreading across my face. You know, not that much is going to change once I'm gone, I say, as I hop down the stairs, two at a time. It's not like we've really lived together these past months anyway. Maybe we slept under the same roof, but the experience didn't really bring us any closer. God, she's so bitter towards her dad. Beg to differ. Dad greets me in the hall, holding a can of orange soda with a crazy straw and a big bowl of popcorn. For starters, I'll never have a reason to buy this toxic sludge again, he points to the soda. Elixir of the gods, I think you meant to say. I take the can and slump a mouth and slump a mouth and slurp a mouth through the straw. So what do you say? One last movie night of your old man? I raise an eyebrow. You don't have to make it sound so funeral. You're not that old, and I'm only moving across the ballot bridge. So far. A whole ten minute drive. He presses the back of his hand to his forehead, feigning feigning a swoon. Whether will you go on without me? He holds up Jurassic Park and says life finds a way. We settle in for an afternoon of dinosaurs and, and Laura Dern, which bleeds into an evening of Nick Cage being his Nick Cageiest. Dad pauses the movie just as he says, I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence, and I let out a wail of protest. Oh come on, I shout, but my disapproval fades when I see Renee coming through the front door carrying a pizza box. I'm not here to crash the party, she says preemptively. Just thought you might be hungry after all that packing. Dad leaps to his feet to help her with the box. Ravenous. Sure. We all know who did most of the work. She winks at me and passes me a potted plant with fuzzy leaves and little blue flowers. I thought this might be nice for your new place. It's an African violet, so make sure, sure it's you. So make sure it you don't overwater it. Okay, I think that's a typo. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a typo. So make sure it you don't overwater it. Oh well, you really didn't have to. I run my fingers over the soft leaves. My stomach swoops low as I am reminded that I'll never have this kind of moment with mum. She'll never help me move into a new place. Never have an opinion about my girlfriend. Never get me a housewarming gift to show me she approves. But somehow this little gesture from Renee feels like, not quite permission, but acknowledgement. Like I'm really doing this. Like on some level, Renee thinks it's the right move. It's almost enough. Thanks, I said surprised to find my throat tight, tears pinpricking my eyes. Renee gives my shoulder a squeeze, then goes to help Dad in the kitchen, giving me time to get a hold of myself. Once the pizza is on plates, real ones, not paper, thanks to Renee, she leaves us to finish our movie. We munch quietly on pineapple and pepperoni as Nick Cage plans and executes his heist. When the credits roll, Dad hits the mute button and turns to me. Do you like her? He asks. Who? The blonde actress? I point towards the TV. Dad chuckles. No, Renee. Oh, I choose slowly buying myself time. Do I like Renee? I don't really know Renee, except yes. Yes, I do. She showed up to my gig with of flowers without even meeting me. She came to uh, she came to me to talk about her and dad without me ever asking. Tonight she bought me a potted plant and a pizza and didn't even it didn't even say to eat any. Just to make my last night here with dad fun. How weird is that? To do all those things for me. But then maybe they're not really for me. They're for dad. And that's all I need to know. There are dozens of things I could say. But honestly, I just say, she has really good taste in pizza. I'm a lucky guy. He holds up a slice to toast with mine. I see this for the moment it is, the opportunity to actually say what's on my mind. Why didn't you just tell me about her? Dad sets his pizza down and looks away, but at, and looks anywhere but at me. His eyes skate over the stack of DVDs to his feet to mine, 
finally he clears his throat and says, I tried, sweetie. Bull bullshit. I did. I kept inviting you to meet her, but you were always busy, and I guess I figured maybe you didn't want to know. I opened my mouth to protest again, but the memory filters back. Him asking me to have dinner with a co-worker, me blowing, blowing him off the hang with Izzy. I wanted to say if I'd known it was a girlfriend and not just someone from work, maybe I would have said yes, but I don't know if that's true. Dad's eyes flick up to mine, and there's a fatigue there that I don't, that I did, that I don't expect to see. Sweetie, I know this might be hard for you because of how you feel about your mom, but you don't know how I feel about mom. The words leave my lips like the crack of a whip, and I wish immediately I could take them back. I fight the urge to make myself smaller, to make myself uncomfortable instead of him. I am so used to shoving my feelings down for other people's benefit, but I don't want to do that anymore. At least not with Dad. You're right. Dad leans back into the sofa and draws his knees to his chest. Your mom and I stopped having a relationship a long time before she died, so it's different. But that doesn't mean I don't miss her in my own way. Probably weird to talk about it with me, but I hope you do talk about her. I nod, the weight of tears heavy behind my eyes. I don't want to cry tonight. Not about that. Not in front of him. Izzy, I say. She's the only person I've told mom about, the only person I've had to. Good. Quiet wraps around us, but the conversation doesn't feel over. Do you like her? I ask, echoing his question from earlier. Dad doesn't respond for a minute, and I think maybe I just bought the question instead of asking. From what you tell me, Izzy is resourceful and resilient, and she really cares about you. I don't think I could ask much more for my daughter. So yeah, you like her? I grip the carpet with my toes, waiting for his answer. My heart fun thunders against my ribcage like a per percussive, yeah, percussive bass drum, punctuating our conversation. Say yes, say yes, I think over and over again. I don't know, Steph, and, I, and really, I don't think it matters. He squeezes my shoulder and pulls me in for a side hug. It's a lot more important that you like her. Anyone else's opinion is just that, an opinion. It's not the answer I want. I almost press him on it, but he beats me to it. You do like her, don't you? He asks with a big ch chuckle. I sure hope so if you're moving in together. That's a big step. I match his laughter with mine, though it feels hollow. Yeah, yeah, of course I do, I say a little too quickly. Because the thing is, I do like Izzy. I like her a lot. But what if it's not enough? What if I still let her down? Good, okay. You up for Blade Runner? He waves a director's cut in front of me. I'm tempted, but it's getting really late and I still have to unpack. I don't know... I don't know why... Why don't you... Why don't we save it for next time? Next time, he nods, a grin sneaking out beneath his mustache. Yeah, I like the sound of that. I wrestle my feet into my shoes and double check the hallway for any remaining boxes before giving him a wave. I shut the door behind me. It's closed but not locked. I can come back anytime. As I drive away in Izzy's van, I'm not even half full and glance into the rearview rear mirror at the little white house on the hill, it still doesn't feel like home, but when Izzy greets me in the driveway it purrs with a smile and open arms, I'm not totally sure this does either. Wait, you can't go in, Izzy says as I step towards the open front door. I nearly dropped the box I'm holding, if she's changed her mind about me moving in. But then, I spot a strip of cloth in her hand and the wicked smile on her face. I did something, a surprise. She steps up behind me to tie the cloth around my eyes, fingers ghosting against my hair. A blindfold, huh? I lean back into her touch and wag on my eyebrows. Izzy swats my arm and says, Oh my god, Steph, it's not like that. Yeah, but it could be, if you want. I resist the urge to needle her more and instead set the box down and let her lead me by the hand towards the house. I only trip twice, once on the porch steps and once over my own shoelace. Izzy stops to tie them for lace, sorry, shoelace. Izzy stops to tie them for me and there's something so oddly sweet about it that I wish more than anything, I could take the blindfold off and kiss her. Finally, she stops me and positions my shoulders. Okay, you ready? 
as I'll ever be. It takes a moment to adjust to the lighting. It's dark outside now, but I don't expect it to be inside as well. She flips the switch and a little twinkling light comes to life everywhere, speckles of gold running along the walls of the living room. She's cleared space on one of the bookshelves so there's an empty gap next to her poetry collection. I thought maybe we could put some of your zines here, she says, pointing to the shelf. And, oh, there's more. She tucks me forward through the kitchen where she's placed a bottle of wine and into the garage. She's moved the bed out from the wall to make room for a second bedside table. On it is a copy of Judith Butler's Gender Trouble and a greeting card that says, Welcome Homo. In place of the usual pile of laundry, she laid down the purple fur rug. Even her dresser has been condensed to make room for my clothes. It's all so much like the room she once described for me, with all the little touches to make it feel like mine too. It's a gesture I never would have thought to make. I take it in running my fingers over the empty space I now have to fill. Do you like it? She asks, voice tight and full of hope. You shouldn't have, I say. And really, I wish she hadn't. It is so much easier to fix to fit myself into her life as is, to just slip through the cracks of this existing world she's built for herself. Instead, she's cleared all this space for me and I don't know how to be big enough for it. I don't know how to put words to that feeling, so instead I throw it on a smile. You have been a busy worker bee. I cross the room to tweak her nose and press a kiss to her cheek. Why don't you open that bottle of wine I saw in the kitchen while I unload my stuff? Are you sure? I can help. She follows me from the garage, bouncing on, uh, bouncing a little on her toes. I shrug her off. Nah, don't worry about it. It won't take me long, and then we can celebrate. Maybe with the blindfold? She laughs at that and trots off to the kitchen for a bottle opener, leaving me to finish unpacking. True to my word, it doesn't take long. I only have a few boxes in my suitcase. I throw my signs into a pile on the bookshelf and fold my clothes into drawers. But when Izzy calls to me from the kitchen to ask if I'm ready, I glance down at the still partially full suitcase, art supplies and loose dice rattling around inside. It feels like it belongs to another version of Steph, the one who isn't a, in a punk band, who doesn't have a girlfriend, who still lives in Arcadia Bay, GM, G, GMing for Mikey and Chloe and Rachel, the Steph who still has a mom to come home to at the end of the day. Did did Rachel ever play those play the tabletop games with Steph and Mikey? I don't think so. Maybe I haven't played the game in a while. Maybe it was a comment she said. I'll have to go back and check the game. Be sure. My hand snakes up over my heart. The muscles tied across my chest. I know that version of Steph is still in there somewhere. Still a part of me. But I don't want to look at her. Not yet. I shove the suitcase into a corner for now. I'd rather drink wine with Izzy. Think about baggage though. Is it still heavy whether you unpack it or not? 